So I finally got to play Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the final installment in the Survivor series. I really wanted to do an attempting to play on the game mostly because of the photographer mode, which gave me some great ideas for custom thumbnails, like Lara looking smug, young Lara looking smug, Lara reenacting Platoon with a dead jaguar, Lara diving into a lukewarm river, Lara seeing fish for the first time, Lara gleefully skipping through a conflagration of her own making, and that brief stint where Lara was a llama proctologist or proctolomagist. However, what I ultimately wanted to do was more in-depth. So with that said, let's begin. Without going too deep into my opinion on the game, I thoroughly enjoyed it and don't really understand its lukewarm reception. It might not have done much new over the past two installments, but it gave me the same satisfying experience as the others. I'm also confused why people were critiquing Lara's character and Camilla Luddington's performance. This is the most fully realized version of Lara Croft we've seen, and while some may see her as becoming bland, I think it's more about her evolution from game to game. And that brings us to the real reason I'm making this video. Having now played all three installments, I realized trilogies can illustrate the human psyche at least according to Sigmund Freud's psychic apparatus. We can do this. And yes, this is my simplified interpretation of that model, but hopefully it helps illustrate my point. Oh, and beware of, like, every spoiler for all three games. Okay. What would I do without you? So, let's start with the original Tomb Raider. Well, okay, not that Tomb Raider, the first in the Survivor series from 2013. Lara boards the ship Endurance on an expedition to find the Lost Kingdom of Yamatai, but as soon as they reach the Dragon's Triangle, the ship is struck by a storm and sinks. Lara washes up on shore just long enough to see her friends and then gets knocked unconscious by a crazy person. Lara wakes up suspended from a cave ceiling and has to free herself from captivity. She emerges from the cave alone on an uncharted island full of militant cult members called the Solari Brotherhood. The remainder of the game follows Lara as she tries to survive and eventually leave the island. She learns to hunt, build fires, forage, craft gear, and take out the Solari before they can do the same to her. It leads her on a quest to rejoin the other members of her crew and save her friend Sam from an ancient ascension ritual. The ritual is stopped, the storms disperse, and they are picked up by a cargo ship, with Lara stating that she is not going home quite yet. I'm not going home. It may be blatant from the term Survivor Series, but this first installment is all about survival, hearkening back to the most primitive aspect of the human psyche, the id. The part of your brain that drives you to eat, drink, sleep, defend, and find shelter is all thanks to our very primal id. It is the unconscious layer of the mind that determines what you need to live, something developed at birth. And the whole message of Tomb Raider revolves around Lara exploring those aspects. She gets stranded on an island, learns to survive, learns to thrive, saves her friends from bad people, and escapes to safety. So Tomb Raider can be viewed as an exploration of the id, or survival. Hmm, interesting that Square Enix chose the slogan, A Survivor is Born. Hmm, anyways, moving on to Rise of the Tomb Raider. Lara is dealing with her traumatic trip to Yamatai by taking up her late father's research on the lost city of Katesh and the promise of immortality against the wishes of her father's partner, Anna. Don't go down this road. You know where it leads. It's the only thing that makes sense to me now. She travels to Syria looking for the tomb of the Prophet of Constantinople, a key figure in the Katesh legend, only to run across the organization Trinity, who also wants a piece of that sweet immortality pie. She escapes, but not before finding evidence that points her toward a book in her father's study on Russian religious history, which Trinity steals, because that's what they do. This prompts Lara and her stalwart companion Jonah to venture into Siberia after them. She meets Jacob, who appears to be a mortal. Go figure. Anna is revealed to be a Trinity spy, who is seeking the Divine Source, an artifact that bestows immortality at the cost of oneself because she's dying. I loved Richard. But he was blinded by idealism, and it destroyed him. 
But the power of the Divine Source proves too much for Anna to handle, and Lara destroys it. Jacob loses his immortality, thanking Lara before getting the Thanos snap. Later, Anna admits that Trinity ordered her to kill Lara's father, but that she couldn't go through with it herself. And then Trinity does the same thing to her. This gives Lara new resolve to investigate more mysteries and thwart Trinity's plans. While there are survival aspects in the early part of the game, it's not the focus here. Instead, Rise of the Tomb Raider is an exploration of the ego. Ego represents the things that define us as individuals, essentially our identity. Lara learns about her father's research, her connection to Trinity, the truth about her father's death, and ultimately makes a major decision about her future. By digging into her father's work, she decides that it will also be her work. But she makes it clear that she's not doing this for her father or anyone else, that it's something she has to do. I listened to his last tape a thousand times, but it's as if I was hearing my father's words only now, for the first time. It doesn't matter what choices he would have made, I have to make my own. Freud originally saw ego as a sense of self, but later revised it to be a whole series of psychic functions, from judgment and control to synthesis of information and memory. Similarly, this is further developed in the DLC Blood Ties, where Lara explores a dilapidated Croft Manor, looking for proof of ownership before her uncle can lay claim to the property himself. Since your return from your expedition to Yamatai, I've grown increasingly alarmed at your erratic behavior. I can only assume you suffered some kind of psychological trauma and are only acting out as a call for help. And if I may be blunt, you're acting like your father when he was at his worst. He nearly lost the manor himself in those days. I'd hate for you to repeat his mistakes. She pieces together information from old records and letters from her parents. It leads Lara to her mother's tomb, proof of her death, leaving her the sole heir and her uncle eating humble pie. I hope you will consider contacting me to retain my services. Through this process, she learns far more about her parents and, by extension, herself. This idea is better expressed by the people who actually worked on the game. Director Brian Horton said in an interview with GameSpot, what she needs is a way to reconcile the pain that she has suffered and also the draw that she has, this compulsion to discover more of these things now that she's just glimpsed them on Yamatai. Similarly, in an interview with Game Informer, writer Rihanna Pratchett expanded on the idea of Lara's mental state. She's trying to reconcile what she saw and what she did with who she thought she was and who she might become. Lara is someone who thought her path ahead was clear, and instead she has been violently thrown off it. As a consequence, she's looking to her past for answers and guidance, and also seeing that in a completely new light as well. Quick side note, the Divine Source granting immortality at the cost of the self is an interesting correlation here. It hints that the sense of self is key to the human experience. Nice! So we have the id, survival, and the ego, identity. Which brings us to Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which must therefore be an exploration of the superego. And no, that is not just the ego with an S on its chest. No, the superego works as an inner critic, a self-censor that regulates our actions to be socially acceptable. It's the reason you regret eating that extra cookie or feel guilty when someone told you the cookies were for a charity auction. Man, I want some cookies now. Moving on, Freud likened the superego to the conscience and posed that it is directly influenced by our parental figures. The superego represents responsibility, or to simplify it further for this video, duty. <coughs> sorry, sorry. Anyway, so how does this manifest in the game? Well, the story starts with Lara and Jonah tracking down Trinity in Cozumel, where they locate Pedro Dominguez, the head of the High Council. She slips into their excavation site and finds a temple containing the Dagger of Shell. Examining the murals on the wall, she finds out the dagger and its paired artifact, the silver box, are linked to the cleansing, a Mayan apocalypse consisting of several natural disasters, culminating in a permanent eclipse. Oh, shadow of the tomb. Oh, okay, now I get it. 
However, Lara ignores the warnings and takes the dagger, worried that Trinity may do terrible things with the artifact. Of course, Dominguez catches her immediately afterwards to tell her she basically triggered the end of the world and takes the dagger so it can be reunited with the box. Doing so will give him the power to remake the world in his own image. It's around this point that the first natural disaster hits as a tsunami ravages Cozumel and Lara watches countless people die due to her actions. She obviously feels terrible about this and lets Jonah know they have to stop Trinity. He wants to stay and help people, but she wants to leave immediately. It's at this point that Jonah becomes the de facto parental figure by shouting, You don't know that you caused all this, Lara! Not everything is about you! It's important to note that while Trinity would have likely gotten the dagger without Lara's involvement, the fact that she pulled the proverbial trigger speaks volumes about her mental state moving forward. The game then takes Lara and Jonah to the jungles of Peru as Lara seeks to make things right. By this point in the story, Lara has become the apex predator, taking out soldiers left and right. She's not driven by survival or identity anymore, but by a sense of duty. <laughs> come on, come on, sorry, again. Must be the id talking. The game is all about righting a wrong and doing what is necessary for the good of others. When Lara's representative conscience, Jonah, discusses the possibility of remaking the world to bring back his brother, his sense of responsibility takes center stage. You wouldn't go back to when your brother was alive and be with him again. Um, and lose everything else? No way. I like this world. It's it's not perfect. But everything I love now is in it. I'm not afraid of bats. I'm not afraid of anything. They find the hidden city. There are tons of those apparently of Paititi and discovers that Dominguez wants to pierce the box with the dagger to grant himself the power of the god Kukul Khan. But the power of Kukul Khan is not enough to prevent the apocalypse and reshape the world. Only sacrificing the god will do that. At the end of the game, Dominguez performs the ritual and receives Kukul Khan's power. But Lara is still able to overpower him because, remember, she has literally become the apex predator in this story. However, before he dies, Dominguez transfers the power of Kukul Khan to Lara. Now infused with the power of a literal god, Lara is faced with one last morality test. Something to say about that. She could use her new power to reshape the world and revive her dead parents. With this key and the silver box, we can remake the world without... Instead, she chooses to sacrifice the power of Kukul Khan to end the cleansing and preserve the world as it is. She is beholden to no one but herself at this point and only has her conscience to guide her. Through the lessons instilled by her parents, and the voice of conscience represented by Jonah, Lara makes a decision that requires personal sacrifice, but benefits the world as a whole. It's her responsibility. Her, be cool, Nathan, duty. Sticking that landing is crucial because if Lara didn't do that, she risks going down a much darker path. Here's a clip from Entertainment Tonight where Camilla Luddington, the actress who played Lara throughout the Survivor series, is talking about her character in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Lara, in the beginning, she was hunted by Trinity, and now she's kind of turned into the hunter. She's the, she's definitely the hero, but there's almost like she could almost be the villain at the same time. There's questionable, you know, um, this questionable actions that she takes, and then she regrets, and so she's very complicated in this game. And many times, heroes that deny their responsibility become the villains. Look at Anakin Skywalker. At the end of the prequel trilogy, he still thought he could act. Sad. So there you go. Lara Croft, Psychology Raider. But Nathan, you likely scream through the monitor, does this apply to other trilogies? Actually, yes, you can see a similar pattern in some trilogies. Let's take the original Star Wars trilogy, for instance. In New Hope, Luke escapes the Empire on Tatooine so he can get a message to the Rebellion so they can destroy the Death Star before it vaporizes any more planets. Survival. In Empire Strikes Back, Luke learns the ways of the Jedi, how to confront his fears, and the secrets of his family. 
identity. In Return of the Jedi, Luke is the most powerful Jedi around, yet he chooses to use words instead of lightsabers to defeat Darth Vader, bringing Vader back to the light rather than falling to the dark side himself. Duty. Not sure if this will continue in the new trilogy. Force Awakens, Rey escapes Jakku and helps the Resistance destroy Starkiller Base, check. Last Jedi, Rey learns the ways of the Jedi, how to confront her fears and the secrets of her family, check. Episode 9, uh, Rey uses the power of Porgs to melt Kylo Ren's icy heart, who knows. You could also use Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy, and not just for the random fact that Macy Gray makes an appearance in the first film, performing a song off her album, The Id. Yeah, just a weird fact that seems pertinent here. No, Spider-Man goes from simply trying to survive against Green Goblin to having a crisis of identity when he starts losing his powers, to giving up the power of the Venom symbiote because with great power comes great responsibility. Also, Sandman was there. So, there's that. But my favorite example is Planet of the Apes. In Rise, Caesar realizes he's a test subject, mobilizes the other primates, and flees captivity for the wild. In Dawn, Caesar's authority gets challenged, and he attempts to resolve his relationship with the two worlds of humans and apes. In War, Caesar stops short of killing the colonel because his priority has changed from seeking vengeance for his family to leading his people into a better world. But the reason I really like this trilogy is because the human story arc works in reverse. In Rise, we ask about the ethics of animal testing and rushing drugs to market. In Dawn, we ask about our place in a world with intelligent apes. In War, we lash out at the apes as the last remaining humans face extinction. There are others I can mention, but we've talked far too long already, and it's not always a direct correlation, but once you start looking for the pattern, it's hard not to look for it. Frodo kind of beefs the whole responsibility aspect at the end of Lord of the Rings, but you could also argue that Gollum is the id, Frodo is the ego, and Samwise is the superego in that group, especially when you consider the ego is tasked with finding balance between the other two. I had it all wrong. I thought that taking control of my life meant venturing out to do something extraordinary. I thought I had to fix everything. But the mysteries of the world are to cherish more than to solve. I'm just one of their many protectors. And hey, I know, these are three sure purely psychological have concepts have that have no bearing on neuroscience, mom. But perhaps this can explain why trilogies are so effective as character arcs. They provide a window into our personal development by showing us what it means to be a person. For now, it just feels good to be home. Hey everybody, I hope you all enjoyed this very different video for me. It was kind of daunting to make, but I'm really happy I did. But what trilogies are your favorites and why? Feel free to leave your comments below. I'll probably be doing some lighter attempting to play videos for a little while. But if you liked this, let me know. Your feedback is always appreciated. Thanks. Goodbye, Mom. Goodbye, Dad. No. You're my research assistant. Oh, yes, you're quite right.